Dr. Ngozi, we, uh, we will start with you. You, uh, you know, as we, as was discussed just now, um, Nigeria has been removed from the list of polio endemic countries. So um, congratulations, that's a huge feat. Um, not easy. <laughs> and as Bill Gates discussed, done with, with a lot of partners. Um, you know, going forward, the, the country has built, again with partners, a very large infrastructure to, um, you know, to rid the country of polio, but how, how has it been used for other purposes and how do you think it can be used going forward? Well, Betsy, thank you very much. And yes, we are very excited um, at being removed from the list, but the work is not done yet. And we have to be extremely vigilant. Um, but what you said actually links to the issue of the Ebola. Um, because Gavi, the Bill Gates uh, Foundation, WHO, UNICEF, the government, uh, had worked really hard on the polio issue to put together an infrastructure in the health system, the emergency operations center that brought together the various actors in order for them to follow, have a plan, follow the same plan, train people who would trace, contact, immunize uh, people. Um, this over time led to the success we are seeing today, but what happened is that Nigeria was quite successful in dealing with Ebola because that health infrastructure was in place. And that is what enabled us using the same emergency operations model to trace uh, 989 contacts, make 18,500 visits, uh, you know, keep it down to 20 cases of Ebola, of which only eight deaths, and prevent a total disaster from happening. So I just want to say that the importance of health infrastructure, uh, healthcare systems that are strong, is very important. And this is where organizations like Gavi and its partners also come into play. You know, since 2000, uh, you know, this issue of immunization, Gavi and its partners have immunized half a billion children and saved seven million lives. When you're talking about prevention, how do you, what's the metric? As Bill was saying, is in the number of lives saved. And immunization, prevention, is one of the most cost-effective means to really save lives. But to do it, you've got to invest in having a stronger health system. And that's what I really want to encourage. We're former finance minister. This is very important. What I learned is that if you don't work on your health system, you can have your economy totally devastated. Uh, you can lose uh, $2.2 .2 billion has been lost in GDP from the three countries of Liberia, Guinea, and Sierra Leone in these last uh, three years. They've been going through this, or last couple of years. So if you don't invest, it's going to hit your economy even more. Well, just to follow up on that, you know, you were a finance minister and you faced, you did, you know, a lot to turn Nigeria's economy around, but you also faced um, a substantial amount of uh, pressure from multiple sectors for funding. So how did you prioritize or, you know, take care of making sure that public health was funded and, and health care was funded? Well, thank you. You know, the, there were, as you say, it's very, very tough. Um, you know, when you're a finance minister, nobody likes you. The health, the health minister always thinks that, you know, the finance person doesn't care. Um, but what we try to do, if you, we, we, if you look at the federal budget, was about 6%. If you add the state budgets, double that. But really, we try, I want to say that investing in health, what I heard from some of the health people is that if we invest in infrastructure, that will make the health system work better. So they wanted us to do more on power, they wanted us to do more on water. Some of the diarrheal and uh, diseases is because we don't have clean water. And so we, we, yeah, our biggest investment in the budget was on infrastructure, but directed at improving access to clean water. Our power sector was really in trouble, and we had to really take a totally different way to privatize that so, and look at alternative energy so we could get to the rural area. So I think when you look at the health investment, you shouldn't just look at what is in the health budget. You have to look at what we're doing for water resources. You have to look at what we're doing for roads and for power. 
Charlize, you work with, uh, with youth. Um, the HIV infection rate among youth has risen sharply. Um, most of the youth living with HIV are women. What do you think is the, you know, and this is at a time when the epidemic has leveled off, so what do you think is the best way to, to reach this population? Can you talk about what you're doing? Yes, you're, you're so correct. Um, uh, most of those new infections are uh, young girls um, between the ages of 15 and 24. Just some perspective, I'm sure you guys have heard all of these numbers before, but you know, today, 6,000, um, 3,000 people will die um, and another 6,000 will be newly infected. And one third of those new infections will be young women and young girls between those ages. And that is, in fact, the only age group where the number has not decreased. Everywhere else, we're, we're seeing a very steady decrease, except there, it's actually rising. In South Africa alone, young girls eight times more likely to become HIV positive than her boys, boys her age. Um, and we know that AIDS is the num number one killer of adolescents in Africa and the number two killer of adolescents worldwide. So we really have to take this seriously. It's so disproportionate how it, it is infecting young girls. I feel like uh, we have to be able to give adolescents hope. I think that's one of the biggest things. I think that there's just a general consensus that if you actually have hope for a future, you actually care about yourself and you care about wanting to live and you make good decisions. Uh, when you don't have hope, things turn the other way. We also, with adolescents, have realized that this is a system where you have to be really, really sensitive to the fact that you're dealing with adolescents and the how you communicate with them, how you get the information across to them. The idea that any clinic will just work, doesn't, it doesn't work, it's not effective. You have to have services that's adolescent friendly. You can't expect a young girl, especially in Africa, where these young girls are still being treated like second and third class citizens, and they're not empowered to go to a clinic and expect to get the care and the need of information that they need. It just doesn't happen. So. Um, giving them access to that infrastructure, that safe space where they feel like they can talk about things and access the information. And also more than just information, you need to give them the skills. And with young women, I think we all know this, we need to empower them to utilize these skills and to utilize the information that they have. Um, things that we take for granted, to ask a young woman to negotiate a condom is not something that is uh, um, thought of as, 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 as uh, accurate or proper. And so these are things that we have to really pay attention to. It's just completely different space and environment that we're working in. So you really have to reach out to them, meet them where they are, rather than you know, expecting them to come to you, and you meaning the, you know, the healthcare community, and expecting them to adhere to norms that you know that already exist. Yeah, I, th I think over here we, we we really take for granted the simple things that we know about this virus, uh, the simple knowledge. You know, I have I have I have heard conversations between you know in health classes of 16-year-old uh, boys thinking that they can wash a condom. Um, this is just all half truths and misinformation that's killing people every single day. And it's something so simple, knowledge. Once somebody has this knowledge and the empowerment to use it and they go back into their villages and their homes and they spread this information, they're saving lives. But this is stuff that we take for granted. So yes, it's, these women are falling through the cracks because A, they're coming from very rural communities. So having access to them is hard. And what I have found is, that there's something so incredibly powerful about the grassroots organization, the community service organizations that are working there already. And that's why my organization only funds those organizations already on the ground there. Because uh, when your neighbor or somebody from down the street who you know and you feel safe with and is living in the same environment than you and they can face and, and they have to face the same issues that you face, there is going to be more trust when the information is coming from that person or the educational prospect is coming from that person. And they also have that immediate access to those very vulnerable young girls that we find very hard to reach. 
And so it's, it's so imperative that we support these organizations because they are really reaching into the cracks and finding these young girls and getting access to information and skills to them and saving their lives. Let's turn for a minute to a different type of, of investment, um, pandemic bonds. Michelle, um, there's a lot of you know, uh, socially responsible capital out there in the market, and, and pandemic bonds are an opportunity for investors in this area. What, you know, how can they uh, shift investment, would you say? You know, refocus investment on um, pro more proactive or longer-term planning and strategies rather than um, spending on disaster relief you know, after the fact? <clears throat> Well, I'll have probably to explain a little bit what is pandemic bond, and, but I, I, I would like to start by a kind of um, declaration of humility. I know perfectly well that money is not, uh, is not solving everything, but money can definitely also help the people, like the people around me, solving the problem. So uh, with, with this level of humility, I just want to comment about how, how to, to deal with this pandemic bond. A pandemic is like a, a natural catastrophe. It is hopefully low frequency, but very high severity. So it's something which is adapted to elaborate what we call bonds, in which investors, and by the way, they don't need to be socially responsible, simple investors who want to have return on their money, cash more or less the premium when nothing happens, and lose part or all of their capital when things happen. So that's a pandemic bond which allows to free up quite a lot of capital when definitely a pandemic happens. Uh, a lot of life insurance companies are already covering themselves through that for extreme mortality, and the World Bank is, is launching now uh, a program in order to, to, to attract capital of investors for this kind of pandemic bond. What is important is that you don't need to wait the end of the pandemic to get the money, because that would be partly stupid. We have sometimes a tendency to be exposed to criticism, but so stupid we are not as insurance companies. So we, we definitely, the speed at which the pandemic starts to expand is also a trigger for the, the payment. And again, uh, we know that the penetration of insurance is much too low on this planet. I think painfully 20% of what could be insured on this planet is insured. So we got 80% which is not insured. And within these 80%, I'm, I got a conviction that the states, the sovereign government, can definitely take much more advantage of what is the technicality of, of insurance. So these pandemic bonds allow yourself also to discuss with the governments about risk management measures that they can take. And I would say if these governments, with the help of the World Bank, would start a program in which this pandemic bond could be expanded in these countries, you would start a kind of peer pressure effect of governments showing that in matters of risk management and in matters of innovation for attracting capital, they, uh, they can show the way. And I have a lot of expectation in that respect that the peer pressure with, will play a role. It started for natural disasters, there are very few countries covered for natural disasters at the sovereign level. And the same will happen for pandemic bond, in which it will allow a kind of motivation for an improved risk management, and probably it will also increase the visibility of the countries taking the right measures and increase the pressure on their peers. Yes. yes. Dr. said Cozy. we could have a conversation and interrupt. Before you go to Paul, can I just say that Africa is actually leading the way. We have the African Risk Capacity, an organ of the AU. 25 countries have come for the uh, weather-based insurance, and now they're going into these uh, pandemic bonds to look at uh, what they can do to prevent things like Ebola. So we're actually ahead with this. So we need a clap. <laughs> Well done. <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, actually, before we go to Paul, Michelle, I had a follow-up question for you, which is, you know, how do you, with pandemic bonds, how do you factor in 
the unknown of the emerging strain? I mean, it's a different kind of virus uh, or pathogen chasing, I guess. You know, how do you factor that into risk assessments? You don't know what's coming next. I think what is important there is definitely that perfection, and coming from a, from a Swiss company, I know what I say, perfection is the enemy of, of something which is good. You need definitely to learn uh, in the process. And uh, uh, the African risk capacity, which has been mentioned by Ngozi, is definitely showing the way. They, uh, they were very efficient uh, in, uh, in the drought that uh, the continent faced. And we don't know everything about drought, but definitely several tens of millions were brought to the table in a system which was probably not perfectly finalized yet, but which started to work. So I think it's quite important that we start. Uh, we know that uh, we will get probably a, a better model as long as we go. We need, unfortunately, to collect data. And I hope that we won't have too many data to collect because data for an insurer mean claims. But I believe that one of the key first messages is let's start, even if it's not perfect, and let's finalize or fine tune on the way. But uh, the concept as such, as it has been explained so brilliantly by my neighbor, works. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thank you. Let's talk about uh, public-private partnerships and health. So Paul, um, in the Ebola response, Unilever worked with several organizations, right, to promote um, or good hygiene practices with your products and behavior change um, techniques. So can you talk about that and what role you see the private sector playing in events like this and, you know, in global disaster prevention and response? Yeah. Well, it's very clear that the private sector has a role to play in, on top of civil society and governments. I think we're all in this together. What, um, when the crisis hit the uh, West Africa and the uh, countries concerned, it was very clear that the first ones who felt the effect of that was some of the business communities that were there. Uh, mines that had to close or distribution systems or, or um, products that could not be produced. I think it affected all of us. And it was not surprising that you got an immediate response from the what I would call responsible businesses on what are we going to do about it. In fact, by any estimate, we asked uh, Boston Consulting Group to make an estimate on the investments that had flown into uh, West Africa and the countries concerned at that time. And we reckon there's about half a billion dollars that went into that. Uh, companies like ours, which happen to be in the bar soap business or other products, but if I use my bar soaps, we send two and a half million bar soaps there to, uh, to help deal with the situation and drive uh, the habit chains needed. Interestingly, though, the response that came back is we're not really very well organized for this. And uh, a lot of the energy that was going in with the companies uh, concerned was not really very well used. Companies can bring in the products, they can bring in the know-how, they can drive the habit chains, they might do communication if you want to, they can put uh, people at, uh, at the disponibility of the thing. And if that coordination isn't really there, then obviously it's sub-optimized. So one of the things, uh, when I talked to uh, Jim Kim was at the time of the WEF, uh, last year we said why don't we get all these companies together at the web and that's the first thing we did and we said we really what are the three steps in terms of preparedness relief and then afterwards the resilience which is often forgotten people walk away when the issue doesn't go in your newspapers anymore or other things so how can we work in these three stages with all these companies and including the private sector we created a task force at the uh, world economic forum at, as it happens to be as a coincidence and that task force is now uh, working. At the request of Jim Kim also, we uh, created this uh, oversight group that uh, is, is more of a global group with a little bit more of the multi-partners in there to see what recommendations we can get out of there in terms of governance or financing so that we're prepared. We went through the same thing with Arthur Cousin and before that, Shoshet uh, Shear and with the World Food Programme that if there is an emergency happening, the world is not really prepared. And some people can better handle peanuts, and other ones need rice. And we all have our dietary requirements. And we don't even know where the food is. So we mapped the global consumer map of nutrition. We mapped where the food supplies are, so that if there are these emergencies, that we can react much quicker. Bringing these companies together was interesting. I've been in a few meetings myself, a lot of them done by people in the company. But bringing these companies together, we actually find very quickly common ground how we can leverage each other's transport, you know, DHL, 
uh, would be a great example of that, and they're actively involved. Or how we can leverage each other's production locations, sometimes our warehouse systems. We are heavily involved in habit chains. We work with, uh, obviously, the Clinton Global Initiative, together with an initiative with DFID, uh, where we bring this habit chains of hand washing um, to people, where we focus on adolescent girls and try to uh, school programs, which really, frankly, are unviable for a company to do by itself. But if you put the right coalitions together, you can reach quite a lot of people. In the last uh, four or five years, we've reached about 260 million people in terms of changing their habits, which is probably the biggest contribution you can make uh, to stop a lot of these infectious diseases. And then uh, our goal, obviously, is to get to a billion uh, very soon, but you can only do that if you work together. So these are some of the things on uh, how we get involved in this. Do you find, by the way, that that, that behavior change sticks, that, that once hand washing is learned, it, it well, sticks? Well, we find that because uh, we find more, actually, than that we find. And I just talked to Bill again. It's actually one of the most uh, cost-effective ways. If you look at the incidence of pneumonia, diarrhea, and um, eye infections now, if you include that, you can really get for a very low cost, you can get reductions anywhere between 20, 30 percent, or in eye infections, we even picked that up to 50, 60 percent. So we focus especially on schools and younger girls who then go home and educate their parents. And um, these are programs that have a certain uh, time period that you need to do that to get into a routine. You make it fun, you make it desirable, you make it affordable. So we have all these levers of change that we know from the normal world of doing business that we apply to this and uh, we measure effectiveness. Actually very difficult sometimes for me to do because um, working with uh, the Children's Investment Fund or DFID or USAID, we had a meeting on that this morning as a coincidence. They want proof of these things. So you get one fillet where you do it and one fillet where you don't do it. I actually feel sad about these tests because over and over we prove that it does make sense and then you feel even double miserable for the fillets you don't do it. But uh, it starts to show up immediately in absenteeism in schools. But then over time you can actually then look at these incidences of these diseases. And our, not, not to be here for my company because it's not really the point here, but our soap, which was started by our forefathers, was called Life Boy. So the, the old man thought about it, you know, when he made that Life Boy. And that was at that time in Victorian Britain, where one out of two babies didn't make it either past year one. And I heard Bill Gates about talking about that uh, just before on the panel. And these, these issues have just moved to sub-Sahara Africa and parts of Asia. And uh, we sort of forgot about that because it was a little bit outside of our territory, if you want to. So um, using this hand washing uh, is probably, again, once more, uh, one of the best ways to attack the issue. Dr. Ngozi, as you, uh, you are chair-elect of Gavi, um, which is a public-private partnership. Can you talk about um, you know, your view on how public-private partnerships can be used to promote preventive and long-term uh, activities in, in healthcare rather than addressing, you know, the short term. So building stronger health systems. Yeah, I, I think Paul has made, you know, a lot of very uh, good points uh, in this. And I think the partnership the, that is Gavi is one of the best examples of this because you've got in this, uh, you've not on, only got governments that are there, uh, you've got multilateral institutions, you've got uh, pharmaceutical, those who manufacture vaccines have a voice in it. Um, you've got uh, foundations like Bill and Melinda Gates. Uh, you've got civil society that's involved. So it's like the kind of partnership that really, and of course the countries that, you know, are also members have a voice. Uh, so this kind of partnership that brings everybody together, if you're going to work in such an area as uh, vaccines and immunization, is really critical. You need all the voices uh, at the table, and you need the private sector to be a very strong part of it. Um, so the innovative financing uh, mechanisms uh, that the Gavi Alliance has been able to, the advanced purchase mechanism that allows uh, the private sector to know that if they produce this very ex uh, sometimes expensive thing that requires research, there is an organization, there are people ready to purchase it um, and, and use it. That's a very, very important partnership. And I think that um, 
you know, building around immunization, which is so cost effective in saving lives. You know, I mentioned before that 7 million lives saved vaccination of half a billion children since 2000, and the objective is to vaccinate another 300 million. You've seen the impact in polio. But to do it, I strongly believe that working with the private sector, uh, bringing them to the table, we have to also build the infrastructure on the ground. And I think if you look at what Gavi has been able to do, uh, this is a really good example of the way to go. So if you don't work together with the governments and find out one way or another to deal with that in these undoubtedly new pandemics that we're going to discover, then you'll, you won't be able to rally. So having people around the table and working in partnership is an absolute must on that. Great, Charlize, one more question for you, uh, also about, about how businesses, you know, um, the private sector can work more with you. Um, so 43% of Africa's population is actually is under 15, which is just an unbelievable statistic. So, and it, it really shows the challenge here. So how do you think um, businesses and governments can be partners with um, organizations like yours and the ones you're describing? I, I agree, everybody has made a really good point of uh, just underlying the, the importance of partnership and that, that we have to hit it from the public sector and from the private sector and the government and that there really is a great initiative for all of us to want to be a part of this. Um, well, <laughs> UNAIDS just um, announced that they want to end AIDS by 2030, which is very ambitious, but I think it's time for us to say something that bold. It's been 35 years that we've been fighting this disease. I think it's time that we stop it. When we talk about Ebola, there's always this really, this great urge to step in when the crisis hits and then we don't see anything through and we don't stop it, and we're talking about infectious diseases here. So this is not something that you just curb or you just kind of, you know, make it less. It's always going to be there, and if you don't watch out, it will come back roaring. That's what infectious diseases do. And when I look at how far we've come, you know, just in the last decade with AIDS, we're so close. So it's really, it's sometimes really frustrating for me to really encourage or to get the private sector to step in and to support um, something that I think a lot of people feel very comfortable with because it's kind of maintained. Um, and I just, it's always so frustrating to me because when you look at business, they have a skill set that we could never have in the world of philanthropy. And when, when it comes to marketing and how they reach the youth, I mean, there's nothing we can do in our world that comes close to that. And so why not utilize those skills to reach, especially adolescents in Africa? I mean, that is the end of AIDS right there. And so it's very frustrating because I can see, um, I can see all the possibilities. It's just getting everybody to the table and to come and play the same game. That's sometimes very hard to do. And what I sometimes have a very hard time getting my head around is how we don't all realize that Together, we can actually be the generation that stops AIDS, that, that, that was part of stopping um, this virus from, from just killing more and more innocent people when it's completely preventable. So we want to take some questions from the audience on, in, from Twitter. Um, we've got a question here from Donna Shalala on Twitter. Uh, how do we make investments in public health infrastructure a uh, top priority of the health and international development community? Who would like to, uh, Dr. Ngozi, why don't we start with you? But, yeah, I bet you like starting with me. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, um, I think that um, it is becoming more and more a priority of the international development community, and it may be because of the sorts of pandemics and outbreaks that we've had. But I do want to make one comment. I think that uh, top priority of not just the international community but governments is the realization that building the health infrastructure is fundamental to strengthening the economic development of the country. That if you don't do it, 
you can have an incident that will totally devastate the economy. And I'll give you the example. Let's just use uh, uh, Ebola, for example. I mentioned it before. The, the finance minister of Guinea said to me on a panel, we were, they've gone from growth rate in 2012, 2011, that was about 4%, down to about 0 0.3 or something this, uh, uh, in 2014, and a contraction of the economy expected in 2015. And what's at the bottom of that? If you're just thinking of health as an isolated sector, not related to the entire economy, then you will not pay attention to this kind of information. So I think phrasing it in those terms to the international development community, to governments, even more importantly, because if the governments don't put it on top, it's even harder. I think that's the way to go, to describe it as something so fundamental, it will wreck your economic growth if you don't do it. Michelle. Yeah, I, I probably don't have any, any final solution to this kind of question, but uh, there is definitely something which is important first. And I, I got the impression that it's getting in the right direction. There is definitely mutual respect now between civil society, governments, and the private sector. And you feel that going in the right direction. And it is needed in order to transfer some of the initiatives from one sector to the other. And if there is one point in which I would, as a representative of the private sector, give some advice to the government is the creation systematically of a ministry of risks. No country has no ministry of defense. The, all the countries on this planet have a ministry of defense, which in some country could be called the ministry of attack. But definitely, uh, there is absolutely no reason for countries not to follow what has been introduced only 10, 15 years ago in the, in the private sector, this conception of what are the risks and what do we have to do in order to be prepared to that. And uh, with the Rockefeller Foundation, we had this example with the 100 cities in which the exchange between these named city risk officer is absolutely fantastic. You don't need to reinvent the wheel each time. You need simply to take the experience of somebody who faced the same problem. And that can also happen at the state level. But it doesn't happen at the state level because for the time being, there is no concept of ministry of risk. Yeah, just this because we're here in the week of the SDGs, it probably touches as all of the SDGs. If you don't have the good governance or if you don't have the education and many of the other goals, you won't get there either. But the first thing that I would advocate is to at least have all the countries put in the 0.7% of development aid because you'll get more of these cases. And we are now having a hard time with a few exceptions, like the UK government who've made it sort of a law. But we have a hard time of the countries to make their public's commitments uh, actually reality. And you don't build a reputation by what you promise, but, but by what you do. So I think we, as citizens of the world, need to be sure that we have a financial capability, which was missing here. The second thing is the learnings from the Ebola crisis, as well as capabilities on the ground. At the end of the day, you need to have the capabilities on the ground to deal with these things, and then create expert clusters around there. We're trying to start to do a little bit of experimentation right now in uh, West Africa, uh, learning from this. Mrs. Sirleaf is actively involved, uh, Liberia actively involved, Ivory Coast actually, and some other countries. Can we uh, do that? And the reason we want these expert clusters on a regional basis is that the private sector obviously doesn't have that capability to be in each of these countries. But the first and foremost important thing is to have these expert clusters on the ground, and that's what we should be investing in as a starting point. Um, let's take another question from the audience. There's um, one for Charlize. You have a unique platform to advocate change. So what drew you to global health? Because it's just so sexy. <laughs> <laughs> I believe that, um, that, uh, that health care is a, is, is, is a fundamental right, a human right. No matter where you come from, how poor you are, what circumstances you were born in, I, th I feel that that's just something that we all should care about as global citizens. I was also, you know, I was around eight years old when the epidemic hit, started hitting South Africa really hard, and I remember being eight years old and seeing 
on the front page of the newspaper a photo of Princess Diana kissing an HIV positive patient and and the fear that of this you know the stigma of not knowing the truth about how you contracted AIDS and and I just remember these whispers in dark corners and everything was so fear based and it was because people were dying and nobody knew why and it was something that stayed with me and I think has formed me in a, in a very strange way. And so f when I was fortunate enough to find myself in a position in my life where good things came to me and I found this stage that you're talking about, this platform, there was no, um, there, was, there was absolutely no, uh, I, was, I was never gonna not work in this field that I knew. It was basically just how I could do it in the most productive way. And so I didn't want to start my, you know, another NGO that goes over to, we had so many NGOs over there. It was really when I started visiting a lot of rural communities and seeing the grassroots organizations at work that I became incredibly passionate about this work. And that's when I realized that I had a, a really strong platform to really help these organizations because I believe with every part of my body that they are the ones who will actually stop this epidemic um, because they, they know how to reach the vulnerables way better than we do. So I hope that answered your question. <laughs> uh, thanks very much. I want to uh, turn the conversation a little bit to um, non-communicable diseases, if we can. Um, Paul, uh, NCDs, as, as they're called, are um, increasing at a significant rate in emerging markets, as you know, and Mexico, India, and China have all flagged them as, as economic risks, basically due to the, the treatment costs and loss of productivity. So, you know, what are you doing? What is Unilever doing to address this through its products um, or through, through you know, other activities? Yeah. So 1.9 million people overweight, 700 million people obese. It's probably one of the biggest epidemics that comes next, which is diabetes 2. And we're already seeing that. And that's obviously a complex problem that, again, is something that needs a partnership from all of us. If you look in India itself, 20% of the population is overweight. If you're one of the poorer families in India, and you have someone in the family with diabetes, it probably can eat up 25, 30% of your spendable income, which is already not much to start with. So the issue is very well understood. I think the first thing, just to be very practical, is if you're a food company, you have to first take a responsibility of the total value chain, which means you have to deal with the 160 million people that are uh, stunted and deal with those, the 800 million people that still go to bed hungry, the deforestation, which comes from the enormous demand on food. And on the other end of the spectrum, you have to take co-responsibility of the obesity. So the first step is to be aware of the problem and to want to be engaged in the problem. And that's not the case for all food companies, but fortunately, more and more get that. If you don't, I think you'll be folded out of office very quickly in this age of transparency. Then you have to earn a seat at the table which means that you have to be your labeling on your products. Uh, we obviously have programs to continuously improve the sugar, salt, trans fatty assets. On all of our products, we offer a free version or a low calorie version, which for us is about 20% of the total turnover. So consumers have a choice. The way you advertise to children, products out there for children that are less than, uh, uh, not more than 100 or 110 calories. So you have to earn a seat at the table. But that doesn't solve the problem by itself. Then you work with other organizations. We work a lot with the World Food Program, with the Clinton Initiative and others, again, to drive in these nutritional programs, focusing again more on adolescent girls, trying to change habits. We reinforce our products, like in Africa, all of our uh, bouillon products would be reinforced with uh, iron and other things. The, not that the consumer knows about it, but it simply is the right thing to do because it's probably the most effective way to give them that. So you have to be part of that solution. You have to invest in that for the longer term benefit of society, which ultimately will benefit you as well. And so multiple facets where you get involved. Um, we've got just a couple minutes left and we've got a great question from the audience. So let me, let me throw it out. Um, to our panelists. If you could invest only 100, if you had $100 million to invest to support resilient health systems, where would you get the best return? Let's start with the insurance guy, Michelle. 
And let's, if we can give, maybe we can give quick answers that we can get a few, yeah, few of them. I have a deep conviction is definitely improving the network in the developing countries. Uh, because I think in the so-called developed countries, you can uh, spend 100 million very quickly, and I believe 100 million in developing the network of the people, this local initiative which exists in, uh, well, in Africa or in Asia is probably the best place in which you can have return. I mean now the return in matters of global health. I don't mean the return in matters of, well, actually it's the same, yeah. I'm, I'm deeply convinced that improving the connection between the existing networks in the developing countries is the best place to invest. Dr. Ngozi, where, where are you putting your 100 million? You can guess, immunization, <laughs> vaccines. That is the best money you can ever invest and save lives and save cost. Okay, let's ask Charlize and Paul. Charlize, $100 million, where is it going? Well, it's going to Africa. Um, but, but I, you know, I, what I've, I think the thing that took me the longest to realize in the work that I've done is that you can't just deal with AIDS. You have to deal with young babies being, getting, their, getting their shots. You have to deal with poverty. You have to deal with world hunger. You have to deal with the psych psychosocial situation that you find these children and these adolescents in. And so I would, I would, I would you know, diversify it. I really would place it in a lot of pockets where I feel like it would feed um, not just one problem, but I think one problem is not always one problem. One problem usually is 10 other problems, and you can't really just look at the one problem. So I would diversify it in those kind of loose terms. Okay, Paul, 10 seconds. Yeah, I agree away. with you because unfortunately 100 million is not enough, but I would probably go I'll to still one. take it. You take it. <laughs> uh, yeah, for us it's also a lot. But I would, um, I would go to maternal health, to be honest, and uh, try to figure out how to really solve this once and for all, because that's one of the goals actually in the MDGs that we missed by quite a significant amount. And uh, the five or six million children that die still unnecessarily, in my opinion, before the age of five, they're not our children. So hand washing is a good thing, but I'll pay for that, so I won't ask you for the money. Um, but the other ones, I'd go into maternal health. 